Let's turn to the last page. And for those of you that just turned to the concordance, you can maybe turn to the left a little bit until you get to Revelation chapter 22. Um, you know, we are, we, as, as uh, it says in the bulletin that uh, it's the uh, finale, uh, which, you know, like a series or a season finale of a, of a show, and that's usually like a, like a big epic event that goes twice, whatever, if it's an hour long show, the season finale is usually two hours. Uh, uh, and, and so you guys kind of get the idea, right? And so uh, we are covering a whole chapter this morning. I was thinking uh, earlier that uh, uh, we should have told you to pack lunch, but then we did tell you to pack a lunch, didn't we? So, uh, uh, so buckle up. Um, but we, we're actually at a section, after all the months that we've been in the book of Revelation, uh, I don't know, 10, somewhere between 10 and 12 months, something like that. And we, find, we are finally at a place where Everybody, regardless of your end times views, and there's a bunch of them, you know, the subject of eschatology, there's a ton of different views, but we're finally at a place where we can all agree. Uh, and that's when we get to the last chapter. And, uh, you know, in the, in the last couple of weeks, we've been in chapter 21, we were looking at the new heaven and the new earth. And um, that seems to be uh, talking about a physical recreation. That seems to be a very physical kind of a time and spatial sort of a thing. Just uh, similar to what we understand physical uh, things to, to be in some way. But then the New Jerusalem that we saw that uh, 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 happens after the new heaven and the new earth, um, that seems to be, I mean, it may or may not be exactly physical in nature. Uh, and, and, you know, presumptively, anyway, uh, there appears to be sort of a continuity between the age that we're in now and then the, the coming millennial kingdom when Christ returns. Uh, it's going to be kind of a, you know, just the continuity. I mean, there's the tribulation in between, but as far as the way we understand time and space, it's going to be kind of a continuity. Uh, but then, uh, and there appears to be even a semblance of continuity between the millennial kingdom and, and what we're going to be studying this morning. Maybe. I, I, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I can comprehend the, the next phase, the millennial kingdom, pretty easily, you know. Uh, I mean, people are going to live a lot longer, but people are living longer in my lifetime than they did in my, my parents' and grandparents' day. And so I can kind of, even though it's going to be a really long time, I can comprehend that. And I can even comprehend since Jesus comes back and is going to be uh, ruling with an iron scepter, I can understand why there's not going to be any crime. And, and, and even I can kind of wrap my brain around the lion or the wolf lying down with the lamb and and kids playing with poisonous snakes and, and that's where I can, I, can, I can see that happening, you know, but then when we go to the, from the millennial kingdom to the eternal state, while I, while I think there's, when we're there, we'll probably see the continuity. It's, it's kind of, I don't, from, I don't know what that's going to be like. Um, that, in other words, the change between the restored earth in the millennium and, and this earth today is that's not so much but the change between the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom that's pretty incomprehensible uh, and I think one of the the biggest problems that we have in understanding it is because we want to take our our uh, time space uh, template and extrapolate it onto that and so we try to think of the eternal kingdom uh, because that's the way John describes it, because he has no other reference point. He's seeing something that's eternal, but he's trying to put it into time and space terminology. And, and, and we tend to kind of follow him in that. And, and I think that kind of, uh, that can get us into some misunderstandings, I think. Uh, there was a boat rental concession at the local park, you know, where you'd go out and rent the sailboat, and you'd go out and have... Uh, for a little bit of time, and, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, the guy at the concession stand speaking over the loudspeaker, and he says, boat 99, your time is up, you need to return to the dock. 
And he waited, and nothing happened. The boat just stayed out there. So he, he gets on the microphone again. He says, boat 99, your time is up. You need to return to the dock. Still nothing happened. And as he was getting ready to say it again, one of the uh, co-workers leaned over to him and says, boss, we only have 75 boats. There is no boat 99. And so he looked out on the lake again. He goes, uh, boat 66, is there a problem out there? You know, things are not always as they seem. And, and as God is trying to break this down, things using, describing things that we have no reference point for, and, and so he puts it into human language, uh, we need to understand that he's probably describing something that, that kind of transcends human language. And so sometimes I think we need to kind of regroup and refocus and, and, and rethink about what we're actually looking at. And, and so he starts off verse 1, he says, And then he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, some see, uh, especially some of the, more, uh, the older commentary guys from a few generations ago and beyond, uh, they tend to see this river as a type of the Holy Spirit. And it, that, that's possible. I, I, I would think that they would say the Holy Spirit if they were meaning it, though. But, uh, you know, because of that, Jesus said, if you get the Holy Spirit, and out of your innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. Uh, and it, it's possible, but I, but I, I tend to think that uh, it, it's, it's uh, while literal, you know, it seems to be obviously something that is not as we would understand a literal river. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was a tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruits in every month. And the New Living Translation, I think, kind of does a pretty good job of, of paraphrasing uh, this part, where it says, On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. Now, it doesn't say that it's a different crop each month. I mean, that's possible. But it doesn't, it doesn't say that. It just says that it bears uh, a fresh crop each month. And, and so I, I was really wanting to understand this. And so I've, I did a lot of digging into, I, I was searching all the different uh, uh, manuscripts that we have on Revelation. I was looking, because you, you guys know what a good Greek talking guy I am. And so I was studying it in the original languages. And here's what it actually says. The, the word fruits here in the original languages, this is, this is what it actually says. Uh, and I understand that not everybody here can... Uh, read Greek like I can. So l let me just take that and, and I'll transliterate it into English for you. Uh, those fruits are the risoi, pinutas, baturon, kupamai. That's, that's what's going to be, that's, every one of those trees every month is going to bring them forth this great harvest of Reese's peanut butter cups. It's in there, okay? <laughs> that's, what, that's what it says. Uh, and notice this, it says uh, uh, each month. In heaven, in eternity, it says each month, in eternity. Uh, you know, down here, when we're down here on earth, we, uh, we're, we're like slaves to time. I mean, time is our enemy. You know, if we're bored uh, or in pain or we're sitting what seems to be like this very endless Bible study or, or staring at a clock that seems to just drag on forever. Time is just real slow, right? But then, you know, if uh, as we get older, or uh, when we're having fun, or is that five minutes that goes between the time you press the snooze control and, and the snooze button, and when it goes off again, you know, time is just like really zipping by. Either way, we're kind of like subject to it. You know, slave, we're, time is our master, in, 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 in this time and space. Think of eternity. It's gonna, there's going to be a passage of time, it would appear, but it's not going to be like what we have. Uh, I mean, it talks about months. Is that talking about 30 days? I don't know. Is there going to be a moon that goes through the, uh, all of its phases every 30 days? You know, is that the way it's going to be? I, I, or, or is it just like today where we... Okay, I'll get rid of that. Uh, but, you know... It's good. <laughs> but uh, it, is it talking, uh, uh, is, are we to understand it as being literal like that? 
Or is it in the way that we are slaves to time, we are subject to time in this dispensation, could we envision time being subject to us in the next dispensation? Now, I'm not trying to get all Dr. Strange on you and everything, but is it possible that there could be something like that, that we, that we are in control of the passage of time in eternity? Uh, we, you know, it's not the way we know it. It's going to be something different than anything we've ever experienced, I think. And he says, the leaves of the tree, he continues verse 2, were for the healing of the nations. So there's another thing. We're going to have time in, in heaven, and we saw this last week, that we're also going to have nations in heaven. Na nations were ordained by God after the flood. He ordained nations. That's a thing, that, that's a God thing. And it appears as though there's, there's uh, in, in some way, this idea of national identity and I don't, I'm not saying there's going to be an American section, a Great Britain section, a Japan section. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. But it, in, in some way, there's going to be national identities even in heaven. Uh, tribal distinctions of some kind. Uh, it's interesting. It's just, and the leaves of, these, of, of the peanut butter cup tree are going to be for the healing of the nations. Why would the nations get to be healed if it's in heaven? There's not going to be any sickness there. We already saw that. So what, what, why do they need to be healed? Uh, well, the word translated healing here is the Greek from the original language is the word therapeia. Uh, and, of course, our word therapy or therapeutic comes from it. And, and I, I, it, it's the idea that uh, because these trees are always going to be in bloom, they're always going to have fresh fruit on them, the, the, the well-being of na the nations are going to continue forever. You know, it's not saying there's going to be healing in heaven, but there's going to be a sense of well-being in heaven. Uh, and he's describing these trees as being, uh, uh, having something to do with that. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. During heaven, it says here that the, 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 you know, the, the gonna be, there's going to be the, uh, the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And then his servants, which that would be us, those who go to heaven, we are going to serve him in, in heaven. That's going to be one of our jobs in heaven is going to be service to the Lamb, which is, I think is really exciting. Uh, Jesus talks about this in John chapter 17, verses 7 to 10, where he says, And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper. Gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and then afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? Not on my watch, he says. I don't think so. I, so likewise you, when you have done all those things which you were commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do so, or to do? Now, most of us, I think, are probably familiar with, with John seven, or, uh, Luke 17. We've, we, we understand the parable. We understand what Jesus is saying here. And uh, our brains, when we, when we read this or hear, hear, hear this being read, our, our, our brains agree with what Jesus is saying, because we understand the privilege it is to serve him, you know. Our, our brains understand, but there, there's a part in where our hearts kind of sympathize with the servant here, you know. He's worked out in the fields all day long, and he gets home, and, and boy, he's tired, you know, and he just thinks, oh, man, I'll, I just haven't eaten since uh, this morning, and, and whew, boy, I can take a break. And, and the, the master says, not until you take care of me, go in there and fix my dinner and then, and then uh, serve me. And then you can worry about getting your dinner. And there's something in our hearts that kind of sympathize with him, right? I mean, you, gotta, you, you, you can't say no if you're, if you're going to be honest in church. You know, you can't do I mean, there's, there's, there's part of us that, that does that sympathy. You know, but this is after the curse is gone when we're in heaven. And, and as we're looking at the, the way that we serve him in heaven with the, with the, the curse being lifted, the cur there is no curse. And we're in this uh, not just simply a utopian environment such as we saw during the millennium, but a perfect environment 
such as we're seeing in, in chapter 22. And it's a joy to serve him now, but could you imagine what the joy is going to be then? I mean, no one's going to be saying, how come I'm the only one pushing the vacuum? You know, how come I'm the only one that does this or that? Or, you know, somebody didn't show up for their service this time again, so I guess I'll have... Nobody's... That's not, that's not, we're not going to do that in heaven. It's going to be nothing but joy. Whew, wow. You know, I just... You know, I mean, it's like crazy. But check this out. I mean, here's, if, if, if we could back up in the book of Luke just a few chapters, the same Jesus in the same gospel uh, says this. Chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 35, he says, Let your waist be girded and your lamp burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they will open to him immediately. You know, now, part of the, his giving this illustration, you know, kind of a parabolic uh, illustration here, is that uh, he's, he's, he's painting this picture about the master's been gone to a wedding, if, uh, and, and he, he's going to come back, and he's going to knock at the door to, to, to come in, and they're going to open up to him immediately. You know, that's what it says, they, that he's going to knock, and they will open up to him immediately. They're not, not going to be in the middle of something they shouldn't be doing and say, oh, uh, hold on, boss, wait five minutes, you know, and then go take care of things, and then open the door. That's part of what he's saying here. Uh, and, and, and so, but then verse 37 says, Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will uh, gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come to serve them. Jesus just said that in heaven he's going to be serving us. Do you understand that? I don't. I, don't. I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't picture that. I, 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 can't, I can't even begin to wrap my brain around it, except that he said the Son of Man didn't come to serve, but to be, or to be served, but to serve. That's his very nature. And in heaven, we'll have that same na nature. That's all we'll want to do is serve him, and we'll, we'll worship him, and we'll, we'll uh, never tire of being able to serve him. And in the, in the same reality, he will be serving us. The Greek word for understanding this is woizomai. You know, I mean, it's like, whoa. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get that. I mean, a lot of us think heaven, you know, we, we picture heaven, you know, in that little stereotypical setting on a cloud, halo, and strumming a harp, and we think boring, you know. And then others would say, you know, I just, uh, boy, when I get there, I want to hang glide. I want to rock climb. I want to surf. I want to curl up with a good book in front of a fireplace. Um, I, I, I want to golf. I want to go bowling, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, and, and uh, I mean, you know, that would be cool, you know. I, I, I like to golf and, 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 and bowl. Just can I get the scores backwards, though? I mean, my, my golf score is 300, and my, my uh, bowling is 68. But, but in heaven, <laughs> in heaven, it's going to be reversed. Right? I mean, you know, uh, you know, this is a song title from the old country song that kind of epitomizes how much we miss the transcendent magnificence of heaven. And uh, if you dig back into your mental uh, reaches, you can, uh, you know, if, if heaven ain't a lot like Texas, then I don't want to go, Hank Jr. said. <laughs> or, or maybe not, you know. I mean, maybe, maybe that's not what heaven's going to be like at all. I mean, do we really want to be all like, nah, if heaven doesn't have Dallas rush hour traffic and, and, and Houston humidity in August, then it's not, I'll pass, you know. <laughs> Or maybe, maybe that is just a totally wrong view of what eternity is going to be like. And I know it's a whimsical song. I, don't misunderstand me. But I, most of our human comprehensions of heaven are, are not any closer. He says, and then they shall see his face, 
and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You know, light exposes. That's one of the things about like you're trying to do something and you don't have very good light. You say, I can't see, I need more light. And then you turn on more light and then you can see what you're doing better, you know. And, uh, um, you know, you, you turn on light and cockroaches head for the, for the uh, corners because they, uh, their, their deeds are evil, you know. And, and Jesus says that the, the evil people like to do their stuff in the dark and, and, and light exposes that. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we see so much darkness here because it appears as though evil is running amok. But in heaven, there's not going to be any darkness, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not because they need, they've turned on the light and there's so much light, except that the light of, of God is going to illuminate everything. And, and, and there's, there's a lot of darkness here, but none there. So what will we do in heaven? I mean, is it going to be like unending championship golf courses like we tee up? And, and maybe not a hole in one every drive, but every drive hits straight up the fairway and right onto the green and then a, 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 another putt into the hole, you know. I mean, uh, is it going to be that way? Uh, you know, uh, that seems kind of boring. Uh, going to be daffodils. I mean, if, if every hole, if every, if every shot on a golf course is perfect, Whereas, you know, the, the, the draw of golf is the challenge, you know. And if you don't have a challenge, then it seems like that would be boring. Or some of, some of us picture, uh, you know, this, you know, daffodil-covered meadows with babbling brooks. And, and uh, that sounds kind of nice. I mean, I, you know, that would be okay. I mean, it's, and if that's your jam, then that, that's fine. Uh, you know, for me... I mean, I kind of picture it more like this. I just, I, I picture me and J uh, Jesus on our heritage soft tails uh, are, uh, riding around, you know, perfect 72, 78 degree weather, uh, tree-lined roads, uh, no helmet, no leathers, or very long hair blowing in the breeze. And we don't have to worry about falling over because you don't, you don't dump in heaven. And, and, and just me and Jesus going from galaxy to galaxy, you know. That's, that's how I picture it. Only, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I kind of picture him as being more of an Indian Springfield sort of guy. Uh, maybe that will be his bike of choice. Okay, maybe that would be my bike of choice too. But I, 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 I could do that. Uh, or not, you know, I mean, is, 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 is that how we should be viewing heaven? He, then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must uh, take, shortly take place. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. You know, there's a, a, a much uh, internal evidence, I mean, very strong evidence that are contained within not only the book of Revelation, but within, within uh, 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 the New Testament showing the, the, the geopolitical settings of the time that the books were written and so forth. Uh, and a lot of... Uh, uh, post uh, extra biblical evidence that you can see from uh, outside of the Bible that uh, the book of Revelation was written probably around uh, or near 95, between 95 and 96 AD, some 60 plus years after Jesus uh, ascended into heaven. Yeah, just, just one example. I mean, we don't have, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but um, Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John's. So, you know, very closely connected to the guy who wrote the book that we're studying. Um, and, and he said, We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist. For if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who held the apocalyptic version, uh, vision, meaning John. For 
that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our day towards the end of Domitian's reign, who reigned from, he was Caesar from uh, uh, 81 to 96 AD. And so uh, he said that the, the, uh, the vision of the apocalypse of the book of Revelation was given to him during sometime between 81 and 96 AD. Uh, and in, even though he was writing about 100 years after that, he was saying it's so close to our time uh, as to, as to uh, say, not very long time since. It was so close to it. I mean, you know, not, nothing even close, I think, to uh, the Lord's return can be pointed to in uh, the ensuing 1930 years from the time of, of uh, the the writing of the book and, and, until now. So when he says uh, that uh, we should, uh, uh, behold, I'm coming quickly, uh, uh, he hasn't come yet, I guess is my point. And, and so with, with that, you know, we need to uh, understand, I mean, you know, I mean, when I get to heaven, probably, you, you know, Jesus said oh, over 1,900 years ago, behold, I'm coming quickly, and he ain't come yet, you know, and we've all got our list, right, the things that we're going to take when we, uh, the, when we go to heaven, you know, we got going to roll out this list of things that we're going to ask him when we get there. And this is like number seven on mine, you know, where I'm going to say, Lord, just exactly what did you mean by quickly? Uh, you know, when it's been 2,000 years since, since you said that. Uh, but uh, the word quickly here in the New Testament language is the word tacos. And not tacos, but tacos. And, and it, it means rapidly. Um, you know, which is different than quickly. I mean, it, but it, ha it carries with it the idea of when it, when it starts to happen, it'll happen in a real short period of time, in, in, a, in a twinkling of an eye, in fact. Um, 2 Peter 3.8 says, But, beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Now, he didn't say this so that we could date his return. He said this to show us that we can't. Because we need to understand that, you know, you know, God in heaven, time is different. It's, it's different in eternity. Uh, because in eternity, they're not bound by time. Time is bound by the inhabitants of eternity. Um, I mean, it, you, but understanding that, it could be like Jesus is saying, well, it's been a couple days. I guess I ought to get back there, you know. Uh, uh, it, it, it hasn't been 2,000 years in, in, in heaven's economy. Now, so I, I just, I, when he says quickly, I think what he means is that uh, when it's time for him to come back, boom, it's going to happen. Now, back in chapter 3, for, for, for those, or chapter 1, for those of you that were here back then and for the several weeks after, we opened up almost every Bible study with a reference to... Uh, uh, First John, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 where he says, uh, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. You know, we've, we, we've, we've, we've read for the last 10 plus months, we've read, we've heard for several weeks back now, uh, and I don't know about you guys, but I've been blessed you know, as, as, as I've been preparing for it, somebody asked me uh, the other day, uh, when I, uh, another pastor asked me what I was teaching. I said, well, we're wrapping up Revelation this uh, week. And he said, How, how's it been? And I said, you know, I've been digging it. Um, I don't know about the rest of everybody, but I've been, it's, of all the times that I've gone through the book, this has been the, my favorite time. Um, so we've, we've read and we've heard, and I've, I've been blessed. I don't know about you guys, but now we're told to keep. Blessed are those who read and hear the words of this prophecy, and that's what we've done for the last several months. What does it mean to keep? How do we keep the prophecy? In Matthew 25, there is the story of uh, um, there's a story of the parable of the talents, and then in um, Luke chapter 19, there's a story of the parable of the Minas. And on the surface, they seem to be very similar stories. I mean, that's kind of the same motif where there's this, uh, you know, wealthy, uh, wealthy 
nobleman. He's got a lot of servants. And he's going to go away for a period of time. And so he calls his servants together and he gives them some money. And he tells them to take care of things until he gets back. In the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, uh, he gives them varying amounts. He gives to one servant, he gives five talents. To another servant, he gives two. To another servant, he gives one. And he goes away. When he comes back, he calls his servants to give an account. And so the guy that he gave five, he says, Lord, guess what, man? Your money is it's the, 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 the and talent back in those days was a, uh, a weight of silver or gold. And he says, the talent is really hot right now. And your five talents is, I've kind of been investing it and I've got 10. So here's 10. I, I, I've doubled your money. He, cool. And so he calls the guy that had two. And, you know, and he says, yeah, yours, yours doubled too. And so he gives him the money and he says, Cool, you guys, well done, good and faithful servants. Then he gives the one that they gave the one to, and the, the parable says, it starts off as in that he was a mean and austere man. And so he says uh, to the, the servant says to the uh, landowner, he says, I know that you're a mean and austere man, and I was afraid that if I did anything with this, I might lose it. And so I've kind of taken that talent, uh, hid it in a sock, and buried it in the backyard. And so here, here's your talent, bright and shiny. I return it to you. And he says, you could have at least put it in the bank and let it draw interest, you worthless servant. And he, he, he him, casts him into the outer darkness, you know, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the, the, the purpose of the parable, and we, we get into trouble when we're trying to interpret parables because we start trying to ascribe details to each element of it. And if we're going to do that, then, of course, the landowner is the Lord, but then that makes the Lord mean and austere. And, and w w his servants are, are afraid of uh, uh, his judgment on them. And, 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 and just because the guy, he didn't lose his talent. He just gave the exact amount back to him and he gets kicked into the outer darkness, you know. And so if you don't, if you don't do better than with what God gives you, you're going to hell. You know, I mean, we could really mess that parable up if we're trying to ascribe details to every part of it. Uh, and, but we ask ourselves, what was Jesus trying to say? And the word talentos, that's the word in the original language. And, and in the Bible days, it was a, a, a weight. It was a measure of gold or silver. It was a, a certain weight of, of uh, precious metal that, that was used for uh, uh, commerce. But over the years, that word talentos kind of evolved into uh, our word talent. It means what we, today, I mean, our, our English word talent uh, had kind of morphed into that over the, uh, as it was going from language to language and evolving over time. And, and what, what the, the purpose of the parable is that Jesus gives to, if, if you, let's just look at it this way. He entrusts to his servants varying degrees of talent. Okay, I don't think we're pressing it too much to, to, to do that. Uh, varying degrees of talent. Not everybody can uh, bend strings on a guitar and make it sound good, okay? Some people can do a fair job on it. Some people like me couldn't do any kind of a job on it. Some people are really good at it. He, get, he gives some people more talents at a guitar than he gives people like me. Uh, and we can, you know, some people are better at, at uh, counseling than others. He gives somebody, people the gift of counseling, um, and, 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 and so, uh, but, then, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't give somebody who has somewhat of a talent with a guitar, that he doesn't want to use that somewhat of a talent. You know, or he gives somebody five talents of guitar playing, he gives somebody else two talents of guitar playing, and what does he want that guy with two talents of guitar playing to do? He wants him to use that talent to, for God's service. And I think that's the, the parable uh, is to teach us that whatever God gives us, we should use for his glory. Now, in Luke 19, the parable of the minas, he calls his servants together. And the mina was also a, a measure of money. And it's the kind of, same thing. I'm going to go away here. I'm going to give each one of you guys some money to take care of while I'm gone. And he gave each one of them the same amount, one mina. And then he came back and some of them had, had uh, gotten a lot of money, some few. And then there was a guy that didn't only had, had the same one that he started off with. What's, what's the, the, the teaching of that parable? And, and that is that he, he, he gives us all, let's kind of maybe put it this way. Romans says that he has given to each one of us a measure of faith. Okay? 
So, so he, gives, he, he gives each one of us this, you know, here's some faith for you, here's some faith for you, here's some faith for you, here's some faith for you. Everybody's got the same amount of faith. And that's the faith to be able to trust him with our lives. Now, some of us take that faith and we exercise it and we use it and we become more faithful. Our, our, our faith grows. Um, and, and others just take that measure of faith that he gives us and never does, we never do anything with it. And so when he comes and asks us for an accounting, we just like, you know, I got saved, you know. You gave me the measure of faith to trust in you for my salvation. So I, here, I've, I've got my, my Christian card I can show you. Uh, and we, we never expand on that. And, and so the two parables, two teachings, and they're similar, but then they're very much different, aren't they? The word keeps here is the word terero, and it means to uh, attend to, to preserve, and to protect. And so whether it's the parable of the talents that's in play or the parable of the minas that's in play, we are to take what Jesus entrusts to us and be faithful with what he does, what he gives us. Keep it. We hear it. We've read it. We've heard it. And the way we keep it is by taking what he gives us and being faithful with it. I, John, verse 8, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, don't do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Now, this is Revelation chapter 22, and if you've been here through our Bible study, you know that just three chapters ago, back in chapter 19, John, John the apostle John, did the very same thing. He saw an angel, he was wowed by what the angel did, and he fell down and started worshiping. And the angel had the same response, don't do that, I'm just an angel, I'm just a fellow servant, worship God. And John's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot myself for a second. And then three chapters later, which, you know, for us means a couple of months. For John, meant a couple of minutes. Uh, three chapters later, he does the same thing again. I mean, we can make a whole Bible study just out of this one verse, I think. Um, but, you know, think of this. If John, arguably one of the godliest men to ever live, The beloved disciple, if he could fall victim to that temptation with what he was being seen, how much more should we be on guard against that sort of thing? Uh, I mean, and then, and, and then plus, I think it just kind of underscores uh, and emphasizes what John is just saying here. You know, the fact that John himself could do that, uh, just kind of, well, okay, let's kind of look at what John's seeing here that made him do that, you know. And it's like the wow factor is just, you know, it's like he's, his, his mind's getting blown, you know. Uh, I mean, there's no mind left. It's, it's blown uh, because of what he sees. Because uh, Jesus had pulled back the veil and let him see heaven. Heaven is not like we picture it to be. It's going to be infinitely, not greatly, but infinitely more than what we picture. And so then he says to me, this angel says to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Which, you know, is kind of cool, uh, especially if we look at, uh, for those of you that are students of prophecy, you know the sister book for the book of, of Revelation is the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And if we look at, in, in the closing words of Daniel, when he saw this, he saw this vision for, that went from Daniel's time of, you know, over 2,500 years ago, went from Daniel's time all to the end of the age, and he sees this, and he's getting his mind blown. And the, the, check out what, what the angel said to him. He said, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end, that it, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So Daniel was told to shut up, to seal up what he saw, which, he, you know, he, he, he shared what he saw. He just didn't give the interpretation of it. Uh, he says, seal it up until the end, because the knowledge of these sort of things will come later. So Daniel was told to seal it up, and John was told to unseal it, to let it, let it, let it out, uh, which I think is kind of wild. 
because the time is at hand. The word time is not chronos. You know, we, we, uh, one of the names for this gizmo on my witch is a chronometer. And, and it, it's from the Greek word for time, you know. And that would be the normal Greek word for time would be chronos. And that's not the word that's used here, though. It's not chronos, but kairos, which uh, can mean time, but it, it has more of a, a technical meaning of an opportune moment or season. That you're, you know, like, like it's not, that time hasn't come yet. That, that season hasn't arrived yet. And, you know, that's wild. When that time comes, and, and, and the book of Daniel that has been sealed has been unsealed, and, and we, we begin real, the time, the, the season of these things that were told here in chapter 22 become a reality mind boggling and check out what the angel says next he who is unjust let him be unjust still he who is filthy let him be filthy still he who is righteous let him be righteous still and he who is holy let him be holy still after describing Heaven, he follows it up with this statement. Isn't that, isn't that kind of crazy? It's kind of wild. And, and I, I think what he's saying is, I mean, if we could translate into American, I think what he's saying, if you want to reject what's being taught in this book, if you don't want to uh, read and hear and keep what's in the book, then you just get down with your own bad self. Do what you want to do. I, I, I can remember years ago, in, in my home church, we had a men's prayer uh, gathering on, on Sunday mornings before church. And we were, we were doing that. It's kind of like what we do on Saturdays here, but we did it on Sundays. And uh, this guy came in off the streets. And uh, our, our church was in an area that was uh, kind of like here where you oftentimes get uh, a lot of homeless people, tra- tra- transient people coming through. And, and uh, so this guy came in to men's prayer and he saw we were having donuts and coffee, and so he asked if he could have some donuts and coffee. And he, he, he was there. He joined us through, through, through our time. And afterwards, we were kind of having a little fellowship time. And, and so I had, my friend was talking to him and, and was trying to get him to realize that God had a better plan for his life than the way he was living the, his life, the choices that he was making in his life. And he, so he was kind of pr- taking him through, showing him the gospel and showing him, you know, that... Uh, God, God had a better plan for him. And it seemed like almost every comment my friend made, every, every time he would share a verse or everything, every time he would say something about whatever God's plan for him was, he had a counter. He'd say, yeah, but. Uh, yeah, well, I tried that. Or I can't do this because. And, and this went on for several minutes, you know, and he had a yeah, but and a, 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 some sort of reason why he couldn't do everything that my friend was saying. And so after a little bit, my friend just stopped and he looked at him and he said, well, I guess you can just go to hell then. And, you know, I spilled my coffee and spit the donut out of my mouth and, <laughs> and, and, and then it kind of sunk in what he said. And I thought, well, yeah, that, that, that's what Revelation chapter 22 is saying. I don't, you know, God is saying, I don't want that for you. I've got a better plan for you. But if you refuse it, then he who is unjust, let him continue to be unjust. Those who want to be righteous can continue to be righteous, but those who want to be unjust, go on. Blunt, but true. I mean, if the book of Revelation won't get somebody's attention, nothing will, right? Right? D.O. Moody said, men who are full of the Spirit can look right into heaven. Now, I, I, I don't think that he's saying that Spirit-filled men and women are going to be able to comprehend heaven. You know, that we're going to be able to understand what John meant when he described gates of pearl and streets of gold. Um, I, I don't think he's saying that. At, at, at least I hope that's what he's not saying because I don't comprehend 
<laughs> what John is saying with that, and, and I'd like to think of, there, there's times when I'm spirit-filled. So I don't think that's what he's saying, but rather I think that he's saying that Christians full of the Holy Spirit can look past this world and see into the eternal world. You know, we can know that this isn't it. We know that we are not bound by this time and space. That there's something better. There's something more glorious, something eternal, something that's ahead that is beyond, infinitely beyond what this life, the very best that this life has to throw at us doesn't even amount to pavement in heaven. So he says, behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the last, or beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know, where he says uh, the first and the last, uh, that goes all the way back to chapter 1. For those of you that are here, we'll just start back. Uh, uh, in, 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 he said that in chapter 1, and uh, that's actually a reference from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, where Isaiah writes, thus says the Lord, and you see the word Lord there is capital, all the capital letters, uh, which when that, that occurs in the Old Testament, it, it's, it's the covenant name of God, Yahweh. Um, um, and uh, he says, thus says Yahweh, or Jehovah, if you will, the King of Israel and the Redeemer, the king, his redeemer, uh, the Yahweh of hosts. And he says, so this says very clearly that this is God saying this. In fact, he says it twice in the verse just so we don't have any misunderstanding. And so God says, I am the first and the last, and besides me, there is no God. So who is God? The first and the last. Are there any other first and last? No, because there's only one first and only one last, and that's him. And so that's what, so, you know, that imagery taken from John, uh, Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 22 comes from, uh, for example, uh, Isaiah 44. 2 Peter 3, 12, uh, 10 to 12 says uh, this, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will mer- melt with a fervent heat, and both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons, and we've seen all that before in our studies of Revelation, but the emphasis is going to be here in verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And then verse 12 says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of what the heavens, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements melt with a fervent heat. Hastening? The day, I mean, I, the, the word uh, hasten, hastening here is the word spudos. Our, our word speed comes from it. And uh, you mean that we can hasten the coming of the day of the Lord? You know, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and, and godliness? Well, that's us. As Peter is talking to us. And he says, what manner of conduct should you have in hastening the coming of the, the Lord? How can we possibly hasten the Lord's return? <laughs> you, you mean by my holy conduct, I can speed things up? Uh, C.S. Lewis, in his book, the a little short book, uh, Efficacy of Prayer, he writes this. Can we believe that God ever really modifies his actions in response to the suggestions of men? For infinite wisdom does not need telling what is best, and infinite goodness does not need urging to do it. But neither does God need any of those things that are done by finite agents, whether living or inanimate. He could, if he chose, to repair our bodies miraculously without food, or give us food without the aid of farmers and bakers and butchers, or knowledge without the aid of learned men, or convert the heathen without missionaries. He could do all that if he wanted to. You know, he doesn't need us. But instead, Lewis goes on to say, he allows soils and weather and animals and the muscles and minds and the wills of men to cooperate in the execution of his will. It is not really stranger nor less strange that my prayer should affect the course of events than it should be my, that my other actions should do so. They have not advised or changed God's mind, that is, his overall purpose. But that purpose will be realized in different ways according to the actions, including the prayers of his creatures. 
I, I, I could put up that happy face with the mind getting blown again, you know, if you want to. But that's, that's exactly what's going on here, right? Wow. Blessed are those, verse 14, who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. Now, if you're reading from the New International or the New American Standard Version where it says, do his commandments, your Bible says, wash their robes. And you think, how do you get that from that? I mean, why, how could one translator get that from one, you know, where do you get do his commandments in to wash the robes? It's a manuscript thing. You know, it just, it's, there's a manuscript disagreement in it. Uh, but both statements are true, so it's not a, the truth is there. Uh, sat outside, uh, in, you know, after saying, let the, who's, the guy who wants to be unjust, let him st st still be unjust. And the person who wants to be just, let him be just. Then he says, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Um, outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. You know, if there's any one verse in all, uh, I don't have many verses of Revelation there are, and all the verses that we've looked at over the last uh, several months, if there's any one verse that should get the attention of the person who reads it, it would be this one. And then, and then it starts back red letter again here in verse 16. Jesus is talking. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So just to put his seal of approval on what the angel just showed John, Jesus says, and that was me. I sent him. He's just doing uh, my bidding here because I am the root and the offspring of of David. Uh, when it says that he is the root of David, it's that speaking of his pre existence. You know, he, he was before David. He was the son of David before David was David. So he pre existed. That's speaking of it as him being the root of David. Uh, David came from that. Not the root from David, but the root of David. That speaks of his pre existence. When he, when he says that he is uh, the uh, offspring of David, that's speaking of his incarnation. Because he did come from the loins of David. David was his ancestor. And the spirit, that would be the Holy One. And his bride, that would be us, say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I mean, you can kind of sense there's urgency in his pleading, can't you? In this come thing, you know. And here you got the spirit and the bride both. The spirit and the church are both pleading from eternity saying, please come. Um, but I, I, think, I think, you know, if, if, if there are people here this morning, people uh, that would be watching online or uh, uh, either live or, or at another date, uh, there's going to be people that are not, born again. There are going to, there are going to be, be people, people that hear this who haven't surrendered their lives to the Lord yet. They've never, they've never bowed their knee to the, the Savior and received His salvation. And, and I, I just, you know, here we've got, the, 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 there's a Holy Spirit that is calling you, pleading with you. There's a sense of urgency in the Spirit's voice. Please come. And if you're here this morning, all the rest of the people in here are saying, please come. You know, we're joining with the Holy Spirit in that sense of urgency because the time is short. But I know because I used to be you and everybody else in here that is not you used to be you. I know that there's another voice that is calling you. There's God who's calling you and there's the church who is calling you both pleading with you with a sense of urgency, but there's another voice that's having that same sense of urgency. And, and, and that's your own part soul, isn't it? Your dry soul that wants to be refreshed, is tired of the way things have gone. And you want to, but you've been afraid to. You want to, or there's other things you want to do first. You, you want to, 
but you just say no. And I, I think that the, 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 the spirit and the bride are both saying, don't say no anymore. Give in to it now. And so he kind of uh, starts to wrap it up with the, John's first conclusion of the day. Uh, he says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Whew, boy, that's an exhortation, isn't it? Because um, there's been some serious plague in, in, in <laughs> that we've gone through. And he says, anyone who uh, um, adds to these, wor- these things, you know, the words of this book, then these plagues will be added to him. And anyone who takes away from the words of this book, uh, the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Now, you know, God doesn't want his word to mess with. He doesn't want people saying that, well, I know what they used to say it means, but we live in a more enlightened age now or, or, or whatever the different ty- way, gyrations people try to twist his word around. And somebody can make a case, say, well, that's talking about the words of the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation. Okay. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 says, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the uh, Lord your God which I command you. So it says in Deuteronomy, don't do that either. Well, somebody can say, yeah, but that's talking about the book of Deuteronomy. You know, because he's saying, uh, the words which I command you, don't take away. You know, this is, this, he's writing the book of Deuteronomy. He says, okay, I'm writing these things for you. Don't add or take away from that. Not quite as black and white, but okay. I would grant that. But Solomon, writing in verse, uh, or the, uh, in, in the book of Proverbs, it's not Solomon, Solomon uh, uh, chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 says, every word of, every, 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 not just simply the words of the Proverbs, not just simply the words of Deuteronomy, not just simply the words of Revelation, but every word of God is pure. And he is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Don't add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found liar. That's talking about every word of God. So I, 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 think, the, I think we can say that God doesn't like his word getting messed with. He wants us to accept it for what it is and then do what it says. And then in his final conclusion, he says, and he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming quickly. And there's that word again, takus. Amen. Even so, John has to, at this point, he's got to just add his own little commentary in here. And after Jesus said, surely I'm coming quickly, and John says, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. You know, John's saying, all right, Lord, you got me. I'm ready. You know, let's rock a little return now, okay? I mean, John's ready for it right now. And then he concludes with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, I'd like to conclude with a, uh, in, in my first conclusion, uh, 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 a quote, another quote from uh, C.S. Lewis where he said uh, this. He said, Heaven will solve our, our problems, but not, I think, by showing us how subtle reconciliations between uh, our apparently contradictory notions. The notions will all be knocked from under our feet. You know, we think that we'll get to... He- oh, oh, sorry, I didn't get Lewis up here. Uh, you know, we, we think that uh, we're going to go to heaven and things are gonna, the things that are broken down here are going to get fixed. He's, and he says, the notions will all be knocked from under our feet, and we shall see that there never was any problem. You know that list that I'm going to take to him? The same, your list that you're going to take the Lord, uh, you know, we're going to reach in our pocket to start to unroll it and we're going to see that there's nothing there, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it, we don't have any questions. We don't have any problems. We don't have any notions. There, we don't have any expectations of what heaven's going to be like because we will be in awe of whose presence we're in. And so for my final conclusion... Have you ever felt like you didn't fit? You feel like you didn't fit? You know, kind of like the fitting rooms at the mall. You know, <laughs> they got that little curtain. <laughs> or 
Or like you start telling a story to a group of friends and you get about a minute into it, you know, four or five of you standing around just all hanging out and you're telling a story and you're about a minute into it and you realize nobody's listening to you. <laughs> you know, you know that, that feeling? Or, or you're next in line in the grocery store and your wife says, I'll be right back. I just got to get one little thing. And then your time comes up and she's in the next state or somewhere. You have no idea where she, and you're just kind of standing there and it's all on you. You, you know that feeling? You know, you just, or <laughs> somebody waves at you, you know, you're walking, somebody's walking across the uh, room or, or uh, you know, you're, you're at the mall and somebody waves at you. And so you wave back only to realize that they weren't waving at you, they were waving at the person behind you. <laughs> you, ever, you ever have any, I mean, am I the only one, uh, you know, <laughs> this world can be very unfitting and very awkward. But in heaven, we will all fit. Just like a custom-tailored Armani suit. A number of years ago, actually, I think it was back when we were going through the book of Revelation the last time, about that time period, uh, we were doing some sort of a fundraiser for a mission thing, and the, the youth had done a uh, something, a chili dog thing or something, some sort of fundraiser. And I was talking to one of the youth and just asking her how the week had been. And she goes, well, it's been somewhat bad and somewhat good. You know, somewhat bad because I think of, there's so much sin and suffering in the world, and there's such a need for Jesus. And she said, good because I'm excited and, and filled with anticipation that he could come for us at any moment. That was maybe 10, 12 years ago, 11 years ago, last time we went through it. I don't know the exact date. I don't know what happened to that girl. Is she still filled with that same excitement, that same expectation? Did it wear off? Did it wane? It can, you know, it can if we don't guard against it. I mean, if we, can, we can have that kind of zeal. Uh, and yet if it's, if it's not nurtured in, by the Spirit in His Word, then it kind of fades, doesn't it? I don't know if Jesus is going to call us home before we get out of here today. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be another decade. I know it sure seems closer than it did a decade ago. It sure seems closer than the last time I went through this book. Will it seem closer in another decade? There's, you know, in the, in the ensuing decades, I keep saying, how can it get any seemingly closer? And it, there's going to be a point where it can't. <laughs> you know, it, there's going to be a point when it is seemingly close because it is close. But it sure seems like that's now. But if for some odd reason that it's not, don't let that anticipation wane. Because he's coming quickly. Amen. God, we, just, we thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for the time over the last several mornings that we've been able to come and study this precious book. Um, and I thank you for all who have uh, read and heard and have been keeping the words of this prophecy uh, in their faithfulness and... and uh, temerity and uh, God we just uh, we ask that your spirit would move in our midst we pray uh, as we get ready for the Lord's table that you would prepare our hearts and that we could all live in ways that are well pleasing to you in your son's precious name amen